faith in Jesus, it's not a one and done decision, but there is an ebb and a flow. There are highs and there are lows. Even if you have been a believer in Jesus for your entire life, doubts, skepticism, it can be uh, oh, shockingly stark and surprisingly strong. But the thing is, we just don't talk about it to one another in the church. Even someone who's been a faithful church member all of their lives, that faith can be cut to the core when some unexpected events happen in life. And you find yourself in just in a very dark place. And you begin to wonder, well, I didn't know that grief could be this, this hard and this painful. And you find yourself that you can't even pray, let alone think about Jesus. But it's not just the unexpected events. Those who are living with an unquestioned faith. You know, you've gone through Sunday school as a child. And just whatever the teacher said, that's good. And you, you come to worship as a young person. And, and whatever the pastor or whatever the preacher is saying, well, that sounds good. But it's never really been tested or teased out. It's never really been challenged. And once it is, sometimes that can be a really a tipping point. Where it, and it can be something so simple and so innocuous as a television show. And it's, oh, it's about Jesus, the real Jesus. I think I'll watch this because I like Jesus. And so you watch it. But it's the real Jesus who never really was. It's all a myth. It's all explained away by expert theologians and historians. And you have no real answer within you as to say why they are wrong. Or maybe you are at the university and you're taking a, a philosophy class, a biology class. You're taking, no, a biblical studies class because you like the Bible. And there you find a professor you just love and respect. And he goes one by one into every miracle of Jesus, every passage of Scripture, Everything that Jesus ever taught or said and debunks it shows how it was all discredited. In fact, we're not even sure that there was a Jesus. And you're left with that. As challenging as unexpected events can be or new information, new revelations can be to your faith, do you know what the biggest challenge is? And it's something that absolutely every one of us, pastors included, are faced with. And it can be overwhelming. It's when your dearly held expectations of Jesus are not kept. When you feel within your very soul and your being that you have been let down by the Lord. Because you have been a staunch supporter. You have been the one in the debate calling, no, Jesus is true. Jesus is right. You're the one who's been at all the worship services. And now when you need, your hands are left empty. That was Thomas. He had received this wonderful invitation from Jesus. Come follow me. And he, along with 11 other people, followed him literally from town to town. And as Thomas listened to Jesus, the, the sermon was basically the same from town to town. It was that the kingdom of God has come. It's at hand. It's available. And I, Jesus, am the one making this available. I am the king, the long-advertised Messiah of the Old Testament right here, right now. And as Thomas witnessed every miracle of Jesus, as he was there in those intimate, quiet moments of teaching around a fire or in a home, as he just spent every day in the presence of Jesus, he became more and more convinced that Jesus is exactly who he said he was. He is the Son of God, the Messiah. He even is recorded to have said, this is Thomas, hey, let's go to Jerusalem and we'll die with Jesus. 
But it totally tripped up Thomas and everyone else when Jesus actually got himself killed. And he didn't stop the horrible events from transpiring. He, he allowed himself to be captured and then crucified, ironically, under a cross, under a sign on a cross that said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. It was at that point that not only Thomas, but absolutely every believer in Jesus, without exception, were just broken in half and all of their faith just poured out and not a drop left. How can there be a kingdom of God without the king, Jesus? And very early then on that first day of the week, Jesus, who was very much alive, after three days of really being dead, appears to his fear-filled and faithless friends in a locked room. And he said, peace be with you. He showed them his hands and his side, and they were overjoyed. They, they couldn't believe what they were seeing and, and hearing, and yet here he is. And their joy that filled them was there because in the end they did believe their eyes. They did believe their ears. They believed their hands as they touched Jesus. He's alive. Unfortunately for Thomas, he wasn't in the room. And as his friends, his dear friends, Peter, James, John, Mary Magdalene, as they came to him and said, We've seen the Lord. He's alive, Thomas. He's alive. Well, you've been in that place, right? You, you've tried to convince the very dear people in your life facts about Jesus and the Bible, and, and they just they don't want to hear it, right? And, and, and the more you talk about it, the farther they seem to go away, and the harder their heart comes. And they, may not, they might not say it as nicely as Thomas. They, they may use some real choice words of how they want you to shut up about Jesus. They don't want to hear it anymore. Well, that's kind of where Thomas got to the point. He just didn't want to hear any more about Jesus. Unless, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, unless I put my fingers where the nails were, unless I place my hand into his side, I will not believe. I don't want to hear it anymore. That must have been really hard for them. But everybody knew that they had been just like Thomas. You know, when you compare, say, someone like Mary Magdalene with Thomas, Mary Magdalene, who was at the tomb of Jesus, and the angels have just said, he's not here, he has risen, and she's still boo-hoo crying and looking for the dead body. Compare Thomas to Peter, who runs to the empty tomb, looks in, shrugs, and goes back home. Compare Thomas to all the men who heard the women's report. He's alive, and they thought the women were crazy. My point is, there wasn't just a doubting Thomas, right? There was a doubting Mary Magdalene. There was a doubting Peter, a doubting Matthew, a doubting John and Mark. So that as Jesus appears to Thomas on this week later Sunday, it's not a special time of reprimand for this one disciple as Jesus gathers all of the believers around him in that room and he just looks down at Thomas with a scowl. Oh, everybody else here is believing, except for you. Oh, you need to see. It's your just little tiny faith there, right? Well, here, if you need to see, go ahead, reach out and touch me. Oh, put your hand right here if you have to. But will you just stop doubting and believe now? That's kind of how we often read this text, as if somehow pff, Thomas really blew it. We wouldn't have, but Thomas did, you know, and, and that's so far from what was going on. Jesus was happy to come to Thomas. He was pleased to show him his hands and his side, just as Jesus was happy to show Peter, Mary Magdalene, all the other disciples his hands and his side. 
so that Thomas might join this elite group of human beings in the history of the world who have been with Jesus through his teachings, his times, his death, his resurrection, and now have seen it all. They've touched and they've handled, they've heard, and now they will speak to the rest of the world who will never get to see Jesus like they did. And they will say, this is our Lord and our God. What a gift Thomas received. And wouldn't we be so pleased to have such a gift as well? I mean, it would do, do wonders to our faith if Jesus showed up. We could see him and hear him and embrace him. Especially in those moments that are just so low for us where we don't even have the strength to pray, let alone think about Jesus. Or where we have encountered this really convincing argument about why this is all bunk and, and it, Jesus is discredited. In those moments where we really feel let down to have him appear to explain it all. Here's what's going on. Here's why this had to happen. And imagine then in that encounter that you have with Jesus as he shows himself to you that after the whole conversation he looks you square in the face. He says your name. He says I love you. I will never leave you. I will always be with you. Though for a time out of view but always with you and available. Now go, I want you to tell everybody in the whole world what you've seen and heard. Imagine what you would do at that point you've just seen Jesus. Well, of course you'd go tell, you know, the safe people in your life, you know, people that love you and don't think you're crazy, you know, and then, of course, you've got to come tell your friends, your buddies here at church, I saw Jesus, and then you might even go online and update your Facebook status with that selfie you took with Jesus. And, and then you're telling the whole world your story. Now, as you're telling your story, will people believe you? Uh, there's a lot of doubters out there, right? A lot of skeptics. Will they trust your eyes, your ears, your hands? See, some people will, right? I mean, that's the reason books like uh, Heaven is for Real are such good sellers and and, and why we listen to our relatives, you know, the ones that are really close to death, and they, we hear them talk about, I, you know, I see Jesus. Or they start talking to someone who's on the other side. It's like, wow. See, we, we have stories to tell. And there are people who will believe our, our hands and our eyes and our experience. But my question is, will people believe your story a hundred years from now? Two hundred years. A thousand years from now. Well, why would time make any difference? If you really saw Jesus and you wrote out your story, would time is irrelevant to what actually happened, correct? What if it's 2,000 years? Like the very first witnesses who saw Jesus, who touched him, who heard him. Are they any less credible than you are? Well, of course, they're just as credible as you are. And that's the reason John would write in his epistle, that which was from the beginning, that which we have heard and which we've seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim to you concerning the word of life. And as he would write his gospel, he would say, oh, oh, Jesus did a lot more than this. But I wrote this down for you so that you can believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. As Jesus came to Thomas that week later Sunday, it wasn't a reprimand. It was a page turn in the story of God, a new chapter heading. Now, Jesus said, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. See, well, disciples of Jesus, that's you and me. We will no longer be able to just to be with Jesus and have a conversation with him face to face. Not now. Now, we have the stories of those who were. And the wonderful good news from Jesus is that this blessed life of faith 
that they had is still available to you. And it comes through hearing this message of Jesus from, from the scriptures, from the firsthand accounts. And keep in mind that Jesus is still just as present, though, out of view. His ears are still just as attentive to our conversation of prayers. His hands are still just as available to provide and to protect. His blood still covers all of our sins. The message, the eyewitness accounts are used by the Holy Spirit then as we hear them to strengthen our faith so that you and I can actually stop doubting and believe. In those very dark moments, when those questions come, we just don't have a rebuttal, and when we've been disappointed, faith comes. Doubt no longer reigns. Jesus gives us faith. Amen. The words that we